So, meine sehr verehrten Ladies and gentlemen, can I suggest we make a start? There are a few announcements I'd like to make with respect to the coordinators meeting from yesterday. That will take a bit of time and hopefully the room will fill up a little bit in that time. Yesterday we decided the following the coordinators meeting. First of all, the report on immunity by Clementa Mastella. Mrs. Lichtenberger is the rapporteur. Then the Directive on Collective Management. We haven't yet appointed anyone. We'll do that this afternoon at 3 o'clock. There's another special meeting of the coordinators. Hopefully that won't take too long, maybe five or six minutes. Then the fight against tax avoidance. That's an opinion. Mrs. Castex is going to draft that opinion. Then the Investor State Dispute State Dispute Settlement Tribunals. We've appointed an ALDE representative, although they haven't yet told us who that's going to be. We'll hear from that later. Implementation of Audiovisual Media Services Directive. We have an S and D member, but we don't yet know who that's going to be. We'll get a name later on. Development aspects of intellectual property rights. The rapporteur for the opinion will be Mrs. Castex. Dann haben wir äh, uns darauf verständigt. And then we've also agreed that we want to draft an opinion on the IMCO report. It's an own initiative report on single market governance. And then we wanted to get authorization on an own initiative report on the takeover bids directive. I will be rapporteur for that. Then we have a representative to the European Observatory in Ohim regarding infringements of intellectual property rights. We've also adopted an oral question regarding the Hague Convention on Child Abduction. That was Mrs. Lichtenberger's report, where we had a few technical problems because the Council had not yet formally consulted us. Then we're going to ask the policy unit to do a comparative analysis on access to court documents at national level. And then there's a letter that we're going to send to President Schulz in connection with the European Parliament's contribution on the Global Forum on Law and Justice and Development. And then at a subsequent meeting, a forthcoming meeting, the DG on communication of the Parliament will come here and have a presentation for us. Then, together with AFCO, we want to conduct a study looking at the possibilities of further European integration with respect to national constitutional law. And then we want to organize a hearing on the European Foundation's statute. That's what we decided to say in the coordinators, and these were my announcements. Now, if there are no objections, then I believe everything will be adopted by the committee. This then brings us on to item 15, our, our next workshop on common European sales law. As you know, we've had a range of workshops in the last six months, and this is going to be the last one. It's about restitution and prescription. I'd like to welcome Professor Cristiano Venderhorst from the University of Vienna and Professor Antoni Wacker from the University of Leida. I hope I've pronounced that right, Leida in Spain. So first of all, I'm going to give an opportunity to both speakers to speak. Uh, we've got both speakers here and then afterwards we'll have a discussion and then we'll see how we proceed. I think Mrs. Winderhorst is going to start. Go ahead, please. Honourable members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to highlight some issues which we addressed in our briefing paper on restitution in the proposal for a common European sales law. 
as time is limited it will only be possible to address some key issues and one of these key issues is certainly what is restitution and what are the contents and what is the style that is to be adopted for the relevant parts of the CISL. Now, when we speak about restitution, what springs to mind immediately is, of course, Chapter 17, which is titled Restitution, and it is about restitution upon avoidance or termination. However, if we take a closer look at the CECL, we will realise that it is not the only part which is, from a functional point of view, about restitution. Rather, there are also Articles 44 to 47, which are about restitution upon the consumer's withdrawal from a distance of premises contract. And there is Article 112, which is about restitution in the cause of replacement. And there are also other cases. When we look at the uh, restitution chapter, chapter 17, in the context of those other articles on restitution, we will realise that there is a striking discrepancy in contents and style. Uh, whereas the withdrawal and replacement parts follow what I would like to call the Aki approach, uh, chapter 17 follows more or less what I would like to call a 19th century civil code approach. Now, this doesn't come much as a surprise because withdrawal and replacement are based on the key. What does it mean? Well, the withdrawal chapter addresses the issues that tend to arise in the vast majority of cases that arise in mass transactions. They contain rather simple rules, not necessarily elegant rules, of course, and rules that produce predictable results, striving to minimise litigation costs. Possibly they fail to achieve justice in some individual cases, but that is not uh, what they primarily aim at. On the other hand, what I would like to call the 19th century civil code approach is more fixated on issues like natural and legal fruits, substitutes or different types of expenditure. It fails to address some crucial details such as place, means or costs of making restitution including such details as whether deinstallation uh, of goods is due or not. On the other hand, it strives to achieve justice in every individual case, regardless of litigation costs or other adverse effects. Now, um, what should be the way forward for uh, the restitution chapters or the restitution part in this easel? Um, so, I don't want to say that in general the easel should follow the key approach. So. Please don't uh, leave this meeting saying Professor Wenderhorst told us the CESL should follow the Aki approach in general and we should rewrite the CESL along the lines of the uh, uh, existing uh, directives. But when it comes to restitution, I think it would be a good idea to rewrite Chapter 17 along the lines of Articles 43 to 47 and Article 112 to take those articles as a starting point and to adapt them to the specific context of avoidance and termination. Why that? Well, Chapter 17 in its present form, uh, in its present form which follows this, what I have called the 19th century civil code approach, fails to address some crucial issues which we simply cannot leave open in an instrument that's going to be applied in 27 plus. Uh, jurisdictions. And among the issues Chapter 17 currently fails to address are, for example, whether the seller has only a right or also an obligation to take the goods back, whether the seller must collect the goods or whether the buyer must send them back, who has to bear the cost of returning the goods, including, very importantly, the cost of any necessary deinstallation. We have recent uh, case law of the Court of Justice. I'd just like to remind you of those judgments uh, and um, whether reimbursement of the price includes delivery and similar costs and also what 
what is the time allowed for making restitution. These are issues that are addressed in the withdrawal chapter, they are addressed in Article 112, and they should be addressed also in the context of restitution upon avoidance or termination, otherwise there will be too much uncertainty for the parties. Now, when it comes to uh, Chapter 17 itself, um, as I said, time is limited, so I have to restrict myself to four uh, uh, key points. Um, and the first of those key points is loss and deterioration of goods. Now, what is the solution currently adopted by the proposal? The solution is that the buyer must pay the monetary value of the goods where they cannot be returned at all, but no payment is due in case of mere deterioration. Now, uh, strictly speaking, this does not become crystal clear from the text of the proposal itself, but that's how I at least understood some preliminary uh, Commission documents and also uh, oral statements made by the Commission. And I hope Professor Staudenmeier will correct me if it's wrong what I'm saying. Uh, so a buyer who in good faith obtained a substitute in exchange for the goods may choose to return the substitute instead. So for example, where the buyer has sold the goods and received the purchase price in return, uh, the uh, buyer who was in good faith may choose to uh, uh, re render the purchase price received from the third party instead. But a buyer who obtained a substitute when she was no longer in good faith, which means when she was aware or could be expected to be aware of the ground of avoidance or termination, must, at the request of the seller, render any substitute or its value. Now, um, I do not think that this is uh, the best solution one could ever think of. First of all, I personally cannot see what is the justification that the buyer should always bear the risk of loss and the seller always the risk of deterioration. Irrespective of who caused the ground for avoidance or termination, irrespective of why the goods were lost or deteriorated. And in particular, it will be next to impossible in practice for a judge to draw a clear line between loss and deterioration. Take, example, take for example, uh, a wrecked car. Now, uh, you can either say that you cannot return the car because it's now a wreck and a wreck is not a car, or you can say, yes, you can return a car, but it's wrecked. So it's impossible to make that differentiation. And also about substitutes. I mean, uh, why should a buyer who happens to have obtained one euro as a substitute get away with paying one euro, whereas the buyer who has not received a substitute must pay the full monetary value? I cannot see why. And uh, when it comes to a buyer who was not in good faith, um, of course, it's an acceptable rule to say that buyer must render the substitute, but, of course, that is disgorgement of profits, and we do not have disgorgement of profits in other parts of the sizzle where it would be more... Um, Yes, what, what you would expect, for example, in the chapter on damages or in the chapter on performance. So disgorgement of profits is an acceptable rule, but it is much of an alien element here. What would be my suggestion? My suggestion would be that uh, uh, we have a rule that simply refers to Chapter 16 on damages. So the buyer is liable for damages if he cannot return the goods or if the goods have been uh, depreciated. Um, of course, also to, to only to the extent that the diminishment in value exceeds depreciation to regular use in order not to come in conflict with the rules on use. Um, that has various advantages. The buyer is in general liable, but the buyer is not liable when there is an excuse. 
and the buyer is not liable to the extent that loss or deterioration have been caused by the seller in particular by the fact that the goods were not in conformity with the contract. And it also solves the problem of the difficult relationship between the rules in the restitution chapter and the rules on non-performance of obligations. So I think this would be a very uh, simple and very efficient rule. Second issue which I would like to address are fruits, use and interest. Now currently, as the proposal stands, a buyer must return any natural or legal fruits she may have derived, but pay for use only in narrowly defined circumstances. A seller must pay interest only whereby the buyer has to pay for use or in cases of fraud or so. And among the cases where a buyer must pay for use is as in particular the case where, quote, having regard to the nature of the goods, the nature and amount of the use and the availability of remedies other than termination, it would be inequitable to allow the recipient the free use of the good for that period, unquote. Now, um, of course, it is possible when you look at Roman law principles and so on to differentiate between fruits and use, but I do not think it is a good rule when it comes to the sizzle. I believe fruits and use should be treated in the same way, in particular when you look at that the, seller, uh, the rule that the seller does only have to pay interest in narrowly defined circumstances, whereas a buyer always has to return fruits. I think seller and buyer should be treated on equal terms, so the buyer should only have to return fruits in the same narrowly defined circumstances that have been defined for use and interest. And perhaps more importantly, I think that the rule about the uh, inequitable, uh, uh, about the situation where it would be inequitable to leave the buyer the free use is a very dangerous rule because it creates much uncertainty for the parties whether or not the buyer must pay for use after termination. And this makes the sizzle potentially unattractive and may deter buyers and in particular consumers from exercising their right to terminate. They do not know in advance whether they will have to pay in a prohibited amount and so they may uh, really refrain from exercising their rights. I would prefer a clear and fast rule according to which the buyer normally does not have to pay for use except where he or she was in bad faith already. Of course that would be a very buyer friendly rule which would possibly create some problems uh, when it comes to consumers, but I would um, uh, uh, rather have a slight restriction of consumer rights in the remedies part of the CESL, for example, reintroduce for consumer contracts the seller's right to cure for customized or personalized goods, or more importantly, very certain period for example, six months have passed since delivery. So um, for six months, no right to cure, but after six months, a seller's right to cure, uh, but have no payment for use in the restitution chapter. That would create much more certainty for the parties. I think it would, at the end of the day, increase the level of consumer protection. Very briefly, uh, a very difficult chapter, digital content. The rule which we have now is that a customer who has received digital content must always pay its monetary value irrespective of whether or not it was supplied in a tangible medium or of who caused the ground for avoidance or termination. And there is a rule saying that the monetary value is the amount the consumer, I'm not sure whether this is a typo, whether it should say customer really, saved by making use of the digital content. In my view, the operation of this rule is very unclear in many everyday cases. For example, I couldn't tell you whether a tangible medium may be kept or must be sent back. I couldn't really tell you whether the customer is supposed to go on 
uh, uh, using the digital content and simply has to pay or whether the customer is under an obligation to refrain from any use for the future. Um, also, it will be very difficult in practice to say what a customer has saved when downloading an app or music or a digital game. I couldn't tell you. And also, I'm asking myself whether it is a good rule uh, to say that the customer has to pay the monetary value even where he can return a tangible medium that is still sealed. Now, that is a situation where even in the withdrawal chapter, uh, the customer uh, does not have to pay and may still withdraw. We should have a similar rule in the restitution chapter. And also, we should take due account of the fact that in many cases nowadays, sellers supply digital content under digital rights management schemes so they can control any future use of the uh, digital content. Um, the solution to be adopted is largely dependent on policy decisions, but would, one should definitely pay uh, due consideration to the different cases. One should consider that there are cases where the customer has never made use of the digital content and will never make use of the digital content, the example of the tangible medium that is still sealed. There are cases where the customer has made use of the digital content but cannot make further use of it in the future. And there are cases where it is impossible to find out whether the customer will continue using the digital content or not. And it is particular the last last case which is difficult to solve and a policy decision will have to be made. Last but not least, uh, because time is almost over, the flexibility clause. This is something which is, uh, uh, has been much criticised. I'm referring to Article 176 of the proposal which says that any obligation to return or pay under this chapter may be modified to the extent that its performance would be grossly inequitable, taking into account in particular whether the party did not cause or lacked knowledge of the ground for avoidance or termination. There's been much criticism about this rule. Um, I can understand this criticism because it has a, a certain, it, carry, it entails a certain degree of uncertainty for the parties. However, at the end of the day, I believe that this is simply the price one has to pay for keeping the rules simple and concise. Uh, it's simply impossible to uh, draft a law of restitution without some flexibility. I should say that it should be maintained, but it's application restricted to really exceptional cases. There would be a lot more to say, but uh, time is over. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Wenderhorst. We now move on to Professor Antoni Vaque. You have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will focus only on some on the most controversial issues of uh, prescription, Chapter 18 of Cecil, since you have at disposal uh, our uh, whole uh, briefing paper. The first issue is deciding which is the scope of uh, Cecil. Apparently, uh, Cecil, uh, following its denomination, deals only with sales. But nevertheless, there are some chapters that uh, could be included in a general part of obligations of any civil code, for instance, interpretation of contracts, uh, unfair terms, and so on. Something similar happens uh, with uh, prescription, since uh, it's regulated in Chapter 18, the last uh, chapter, and known of its provisions speaks of buyer and seller. We find uh, parties, we find person, we find debtor and creditor, but no mention of um, seller and buyer. Uh, furthermore, we have a provision uh, dealing with prescription of personal injuries. The personal injuries must not be related necessarily to sales. So... Uh, the point is deciding if uh, these rules apply to any obligation, 
coming or not from a, sale, a sales contract, or if it must be restricted to sales. The, the, the current uh, regulation in the proposal does not, uh, does not give a clear uh, clues uh, for deciding on one side or the other. Uh, another point is that uh, Cecil follows uh, mainly uh, PECL and the draft common frame of reference. But some of its provisions have been omitted and some others have been altered. Uh, and this modification of the uh, preceding uh, rules in the draft common frame of reference uh, has not always uh, been successful since, as we will see, there are some uh, problems in this uh, regulation. The last general question is uh, some difficulties with definitions. We found, uh, for instance, uh, mediation, uh, which is defined, just copying what the Directive on Mediation says, but other uh, crucial concepts, such as beginning of judicial proceedings, acknowledgement, um, negotiations, ancillary right are not defined, and that uh, creates, uh, as we will see, some uh, problems. Uh, in in Puckel, uh the subject matter of prescription was the claim. Claim was a, a translation of the German word Anspruch, and was defined as uh, the right to performance of an obligation. Uh, this is more or less what Cecil still says, only adding uh, enforce, the right to enforce an uh, obligation, the right to enforce performance of an obligation. And uh, Article um, 184 um, refers uh, not only, uh, sorry, uh, Article uh, 178 uh, refers not only to uh, right to enforce performance on, of an obligation, but also to any right ancillary to such a right. And we wonder what means ancillary right, since it's not uh, defined. One option would be that ancillary right is also a right to enforce performance of an obligation. For instance, the obligation to pay interest. But then it has no sense saying a right to enforce performance and any right ancillary, since it's the same. The other possibility is ancillary right means any other right different from a right to enforce performance of an obligation. And then it would cover uh, remedies such as withholding performance, price reduction, and termination. Okay, uh, as for withholding performance, if you uh, read Article uh, 185.1, you see that uh, it never, uh, it's never subject to prescription. And if you uh, look at price reduction, it can be uh, seen also as a right to enforce performance in the, in the sense of the right to recover the price excess from the seller, according to Article 120. Then we only have termination. And uh, termination sometimes uh, depends on... Um, giving notice in a reasonable time. For instance, 119, 139. Uh, the question is then if this reasonable time is time for prescription. But in other cases, notice is not required. For instance, uh, Article uh, 119, 2B, 139, 3. And then 
uh, we don't know what happens, if this termination is subject to prescription or not. So uh, this concept of ancillary right must be defined or simply uh, suppressed if it doesn't mean anything else than a right to enforce performance of an obligation. Mm, another uh, question, uh, I think very important, is periods of, of prescription. Apparently, there are two periods. A short period, two years, and a long period, ten years, plus a 30-year period for personal injuries. But we don't know to which claims or to which rights apply each of these uh, periods, because the, the, the provision says nothing. Of course, both cannot be general periods of prescription. It has no sense that we have two uh, general periods of prescription. Then one of them should be the general one and the other one a special one. If we uh, remember that in uh, DCFR the short period of three years was the general period, we can think, okay, now the two-year period is the general one. But we still don't know to which claims or rights apply the 10-year period. Another option could be that uh, the 10-year period is not a prescription period, but a long stop. But as I will try to demonstrate later, I think there's no long stop rule in uh, CESAL. And that's very important because commencement of prescription uh, in relation to the short period is an, a subjective one and depends on uh, knowledge. And uh, as far as the debtor uh, has no knowledge, prescription does not commence. Uh, extension of uh, periods of uh, prescription uh, is limited to one ground for suspension and uh, two grounds for postponement. As far as uh, suspension uh, is concerned, we have that the beginning of judicial proceedings is a ground of suspension, but we don't know exactly what beginning of judicial proceedings mean, since there is no uh, definition of that concept. Even though if, uh, in most of European legal systems uh, judicial proceedings um, mean a ground for renewal or interruption of prescription, uh, Cecil follows uh, maybe the more, the more modern line of considering it as a ground for suspension. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's no problem, but uh, we must consider if all judicial proceedings uh, must lead to uh, suspension. Uh, the question is if uh, execution uh, proceedings, which mm, uh, presuppose that there's a judgment or that the uh, uh, creditor is provided with an executive title deserve also uh, suspension and not renewal. Uh, it's also controversial uh, the uh, suspension uh, ground, apparently suspension ground, uh, that we uh, find in Article uh, 186 uh, sorry, uh, 181, um, when it says that, um, paragraph 2, when the proceedings end within the last six months of the prescription period without a decision on the marriage, the period of prescription does not expire before six months have passed. Uh, okay, uh, when the proceedings end without a decision on the marriage, that could uh, be caused by abandonment uh, of the claim by the, by the creditor. And then the question is why 
it deserves the same treatment as if the, if, uh, the, the, the claim has been filed uh, before an incompetent uh, court. And even more, why six months? Uh, and even more, uh, it looks like not suspension but postponement since there are six uh, extra months of uh, prescription. Uh, in my opinion, uh, there's a missing ground for suspension, which is impediment, an impediment beyond creditor control, because it's a ground uh, that excuses non-performance, and for the same uh, reason, it should, uh, it should um, be a case, a ground for uh, suspension uh, also. Mm. The, uh, the ground for postponement based on uh, incapacity is unilateral. Uh, it only affects the uh, debtor who has no representative. And the question is why uh, it must be unilateral and not uh, bi uh, bilateral. Uh, there's no reason to uh, restrict it to uh, one side uh, one party of the uh, uh, relationship. Mm. As far as uh, the question of uh, uh, the maximum length of period, uh, whereas uh, 26 of uh, Thessal uh, differentiates uh, prescription and preclusion, but this, this um, this distinction is not to be found uh, on, the, uh, on the rules. Uh, in fact, there are good reasons to think that there, are, there is no rule on a long stop period. Since, uh, for instance, Article 191 refers to both periods, Article 7, uh, 182, uh, 183 to neither period, uh, and Article 186 allows to shorten or to lengthen both periods of prescription. Uh, shortening or lengthening does not match with a long stop uh, rule. And a long stop, a long stop uh, rule is necessary because commencement uh, in the short period depends on knowledge, and therefore. Uh, if the uh, creditor has no knowledge, uh, prescription does not commence. Uh, as far as renewal of uh, prescription uh, period is concerned, uh, the novelty of uh, a new short period in any time uh, once uh, prescription, prescription is interrupted, I think uh, must be reconsidered. Uh, let's take the example of uh, the claim for personal injuries, 30 years, according to Cecil. Um, if after uh, one year the debtor uh, acknowledges the existence of uh, the uh, right and uh, renewal is produced, then we have only a short period, two years. So, in practice, the 30-year period has turned into a 30-year period in this example. Uh, and I think that's too much advantage for the, for the, um, for the debtor. Uh, in relation to effects of uh, prescription, sorry, um, there's a problem with the mixing uh, the effects. On the one hand, the weak effect, uh, the, the debtor can refu can't refuse performance and at the same time uh, the strong effect because uh, some remedies are extinguished and that's a little bit uh, uh, odd to mix uh, both, um, both uh, uh, effects and last uh, as for party autonomy uh, it's not clear uh, when, uh, which is the scope of party autonomy, because it says, the, the article says, in particular, 
and we don't know if in particular uh, only tries to emphasize or is but an example. So uh, it's disputable whether uh, parties can uh, convert uh, suspension periods into renewal periods or if they can add new grounds for suspension or for uh, postponement, etc. And it's, it's a little bit confusing the other because uh, there's a rule saying that uh, um, in a contract between a trader and a consumer, this article may not be applied to the detriment of the consumer just afterwards saying that parties uh, enjoy the maximum autonomy to uh, introduce changes and saying that this, uh, this provision cannot be uh, derogated by the parties. So uh, I've, I've, uh, I've highlighted uh, some uh, controversial issues and in my opinion uh, the actual uh, wording of Cecil is, is unsatisfactory and in my opinion uh, we can like it or we can dislike it but uh, Peckel and uh, the DCFR offer a consistent system of prescription rules and uh, maybe adopting uh, the DCFR rules in a whole maybe uh, suppressing uh, rules dealing with uh, capacity, for instance, would be uh, a better solution. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Vaked. So, the Commission? Yes, thank you very much. Given the lack of time, I just uh, stick to the point. So, I just start with the last sentence of, um, that Mr. Vaker talked about. That was a nice overview. And here, I'd just like to talk about some of the important points in the political discussion, so that the uh, prescription deadlines and extending those periods of time. So please let me explain what the state of play is at the moment in B2C. That's regulated by community law. So that's from uh, 9944. So we don't have a prescription time period foreseen in that, but only a material deadline of two years within which we need to uh, see the mistake become apparent. And then the member states have the opportunity to maintain the period of time, and that could then be the shortest amount of time could be two years after delivery, or they wouldn't uh, shorten the material deadline. And all member states, almost all of them have that. There are two deadlines, and many have uh, reduced that, in fact, to one. So what are we doing? What is our approach with the common European sales law? Well, we only have one deadline. That means that we have a more straightforward, uh, less uh, burdensome regulation compared with uh, other national legislation if we only have this prescription deadline without having the material deadline. So that's the first point that I wanted to explain. And secondly, something that uh, Professor Vacker has addressed, and why, if we've got this system, the DCFR and PECL, why are we taking on that? Well, that's quite simple, because in practice, our system has the same results as a PECL and the CDFR. And that's because they have an objective starting point, and then they have this three-year time period that they depend on. So this time period can be suspended if there is a shortcoming or a suspected shortcoming, and the uh, maximum amount of time that that can be stopped for is 10 years. So we have the same result. 
So if you say that we have the adjective commencement after delivery, and then we say that there's the short period of three years, but the maximum amount could be uh, ten years in the event of such a case. Well, we're saying, well, we're going to have a shorter time period that starts with a subjective time period, so the suspected event or the event, and then we've got the maximum amount of time, which is ten years. So the result is the same. So we've got two years with the short period instead of the three years with a DCFR, and I'll explain why later. But we have that uh, subjective commencement, and why do we choose that? Well, that was that uh, suspected shortcoming. So there are three reasons there. All the models of legislation in uh, Europe, I think, the most modern is in France from 2008, and they all have a starting point of this uh, subjective commencement. And secondly, there's an international trend. And thirdly, we've got precedence in EU law with the prescription deadline, and that's one of the directives, and that's also got a deadline that starts with the subjective commencement. But if we look at the material grounds for starting with the subjective commencement, that's because it allows for a relatively short period of time. And that's why we've got the three years that the expert group uh, suggested, and that's been shortened to that, looking at PECL as well. That's because normally, if you look at normal trading relations and consumer relations, well, everyone knows about two years, and that's why we did ch choose the two-year time period, but also that's from the cognizance of the consumer. So if we have this subjective commencement and we choose that, well, it could be that we wouldn't have this cognizance or suspected Cognizance, there could be an exception, of course. And then at some point I would stop, and that is the aim of the tenure period, which uh, creates legal certainty. So the tenure period, of course, is something that's overestimated in discussions, and the significance is overestimated. And why? Well, because people say that, yes, uh, the consumer has ten years to... Uh, exercise their rights, but that's not correct in practice. And why not? Well, that's because, first of all, because the subjective period of time if, well, with Article 185, it says that if one of the t periods of time is over, well, then it's over and then the prescription has taken place. So then when the shorter time period is over, so that's Article 1851, well, then we no longer have the longer period of time. So, in practice, we have the two year time period. And secondly, at the start of the two year time period, it's not cognizance, it's a suspected cognizance. So, when the uh, consumer should have realised that there was a shortcoming. And in many cases, it's far earlier. For instance, most shortcomings are, or most problems are seen six months after delivery, but at the latest, within six months. It's only very rarely in exceptional cases where this would occur later on. In practice, therefore, we mainly see the two-year period, and that's a lot shorter than ten years. And then the second point is one that's very important, and... We have the argument, of course, that perhaps the consumer is aware of the shortcoming eight years afterwards. Or these are exceptional cases, of course, but just for the argument, uh, we'd have to assume this, and then the consumer would have to prove after eight years that the mistake or the shortcoming took place uh, eight years ago after delivery, and that's often impossible in practice. So that means that the 10-year time period is far less significant. It's only really there to uh, afford legal certainty. And then perhaps just very briefly, we don't have much time, just two comments about what uh, Madame Vendervist had to say. 
So she was uh, making uh, some very important points, and she was talking about Article 17 and what's regulated there, rather Chapter 17, corrects the speaker, and why restitution and uh, the model there doesn't always take place with withdrawal. And of course, with European sales law, there are many different details involved there, of course. But we have uh, two different models for regulating that that we've chosen. That's firstly because restitution after the right of withdrawal, that's after... Because in practice, we can see that if we've got this all harmonized in different member states and that's been taken on. And the second point is a much more important point, of course, that was stressed in the document. But there is a difference between restitution after withdrawal and after termination or avoidance. So with withdrawal, there's a case where perhaps a consumer only has two weeks, a very short period of time, and perhaps there's no problem with the good, but they're able to return that after two weeks because there's something uh, within the contract that has been chosen. However, if we look at avoidance and termination, there's perhaps something that the trader has done wrong. So that's why we need to have different regulation, although we can uh, talk about the individual provisions, of course. I don't have too much time to do that today. The second point, however, is something that I would like to mention, and that's why we've limited that in Chapter 17 to that shorter provision. And, of course, we would have liked to see the model of the DCFR being taken over, where we have a complete capital, a rather chapter on that. But it would be very complicated and very long-winded. So in our proposal on the Common European Sales Law, we just wanted to stick to the points that are relevant in practice for restitution after withdrawal and also restitution after avoidance and termination. That's why we have tried to be very concise and make it as simple as possible. And just uh, to conclude, yes, so restitution and withdrawal often does present a dilemma and it's a dilemma that we had as well. We want to be concise and make it comprehensible but on the other hand we also want to make sure that we can have individual cases regulated properly and that's very difficult and sometimes it's very long and complicated so we're trying to achieve that with uh, two clauses. So it's 174 and 176. So that's our approach. We're trying to have a concise, understandable regulation on the one hand, but on the other hand, we're trying to make sure that we have those clauses so that they allow us to uh, look at that in the right way. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Madam Tyne, please. Yes, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank both of the speakers for their very uh, comprehensive and detailed positions that they expressed. And if I can sum it up, I'd just like to say that uh, I think we had a lot of criticism, but I'd just like to draw two points from the presentations. Professor Venderhorst talked about risks, and I think that I don't think it's really all that bad what has been set out so if we look at the division of risks between trader and consumer I think uh, sometimes that's quite arbitrary but we need to make sure that both parties irrespective of what is being dealt with whether it's the damages or loss but we want to make sure that one isn't disadvantaged more than the other So I'd also like to uh, address some of the points that Professor Wacher made. He said that 
we've got these prescription periods and whether they're renewed or suspended and whether that should be the case I can only say that uh, we all are aware of different systems and I don't think we're going to make any progress if we just argue about whether the prescription period should be suspended or renewed. I think we've got different systems in all 27 member states. So it's very difficult to look at all the different cases. However, such a discussion doesn't really uh, let us make any headway, so I don't really see a problem in whether it's renewal or suspension. And there's another question I have as regards both presentations. What's been stated today, is that your personal academic opinion or is that something that's represented by all of the professors at your university or representatives from your member state? Is that shared by many different people? For what uh, parts here are you speaking for personally? So I think also my experience as a practitioner and not as a politician is that if we have uh, questions put to professors there's always a criticism. I think each professor often could spend uh, a whole day talking about uh, minor legal uh, issues and perhaps for months or years they could exchange opinions on various subjects and I think we could see that in uh, Germany as well for instance but if we continue along those lines we're never going to reach a conclusion if we just look at some paragraphs and look at all the tiny little details and start splitting heads. So I think if we look at perhaps the fact that we might get a thousand or so amendments tabled because uh, each colleague has received some opinions from professors from their member states and then we'd have all those uh, pooling together to produce thousands of amendments. So I think if we're all going to work together and we need to look at the whole of the issue. I'm sure there are many different issues present and we need to try to just have faith in the fact that it will all turn out all right and with time uh, we would be able to resolve the issues that would surely arise. Or perhaps otherwise we're going to have all those practitioners and experts in member states and we're going to have to work for it all to be accepted and I think and there's not really any other solution because at the moment if we have all of these hearings and continue that way we're never going to have something that we're going to see probably. This is the let me just uh, add <coughs> that uh, this is the last uh, presentation. We're going to have uh, our discussions now with national parliaments. We will have reports, we will have drafts. The we will be taking the decisions at the end of the day and not the professors. Of course, we can receive advice. I have one question in addition to what Mrs. Time said and what Mr. Stolmeyer said. When this 10-year deadline if this gives rise to an enormous political discussion, <clears throat> wouldn't it be easier just to reduce this to four years? Wouldn't it be better to have a smaller <coughs> number instead of having a longer uh, delay, which uh, only affects uh, exotic cases? Why not shorter? Perhaps you could give us a brief answer to that. Vendehorst, and then the other professor, please. Well, I must disappoint uh, Madam Time. What I was presenting was not a professor's opinion. If I had uh, wanted to present, make an academic presentation, it would have been quite different. I have had several discussions with practitioners in this area. I myself am in a working group on European uh, sales law, which is uh, made up of practitioners.
This rule has to be applied at the end of the day. And if the rule cannot uh, deal with uh, a, uh, a very ordinary day-to-day -day case, I download something from the Internet, I buy a refrigerator or a washing machine, it's delivered, and uh, it turns out that it doesn't work. If this law cannot resolve these cases, then I don't think that this is just an academic problem. Thank you very much. Very, very, very shortly. Um, yeah, you, you, you can think that there are two periods, uh, two years, ten years, one is uh, subjective, one is objective. But uh, as I said, there's no long stop rule. And uh, Cecil uh, allows uh, parties to uh, lengthen the 10 year period. Uh, so uh, if Cecil uh, is uh, addressed to uh, rural sales and the, uh, the main point is uh, non conformity, there's an easier rule in Directive uh, on Consumer Sales that says that uh, prescription uh, occurs two years after delivery. And uh, if not, we could find that uh, why not the, 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 the seller discovers after eight years that his uh, car had a defect from the very beginning. It's, uh, why uh, eight years? Uh, and then eight years plus two years? Or ten years is the is maximum? Or the parties has modified it and say that uh, extended to 30 years? I think uh, the point is in practice, not only at the universities, uh, very important, and I think it deserves uh, clarification. Good. Vielen herzlichen Dank an die Well, thank you very much to our two experts. I would now like to welcome the Minister for the Economy and Tourism from the Cypriot Presidency. He is uh, partially responsible for our subject area, intellectual property rights, but also company law. Yesterday we had the Minister of Justice here, and he will present the uh, Cyprus Presidency's program. You have the floor. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Vice Chairman and members of the Yuri uh, Committee, My presentation today is uh, part of the tradition of a presidency presenting its uh, priorities and the actions it has planned in the upcoming presidency with regards to intellectual property and company law. But um, beyond that, uh, fulfilling that tradition, I am here to show my respect for the European Parliament and uh, the role that it plays in making Europe more democratic in order to bring it closer to its citizens. The main message of the Cyprus Presidency is a better Europe for its citizens. The Treaty of Lisbon went into effect and broadened the powers of the European Parliament, making it the co-legislator along with the Council of Ministers. We are prepared to work very closely with the European Parliament in order to um, promote our files in the second half of 2012 with regards to 
uh, copyright and company law. So I would like to present to you our basic policies and the subjects which we will be working on over the next six months. But uh, before I explain to you our priorities, I would like to congratulate all the members of uh, the Committee and the European Commission and the preceding presidencies, Danish and Polish, for all of the progress which has been made, especially with regards to the agreement on the European patent, which uh, was the subject of decades of uh, discussion. We attach a great deal of uh, importance to Europe 2020 and the legal framework for protecting intellectual property rights within the EU because this is a necessary precondition for strengthening competitiveness and uh, innovation in the EU. We would like to have an internal market, single market for intellectual property rights. This is why the Polish, Danish and Cyprus presidencies have worked with you and the European Commission in order to adopt proposals to adjust to ad amend 2016 with regards to copyright laws and to assign to the Harmonization Agency intellectual property rights uh, rules and the observatory on the violation of in intellectual copyright laws covering both the private and public sectors. And the, thirdly, the proposal of a directive by the European Parliament and, your, and Council of Ministers regarding the use of certain orphan works. Our priority in the presidency is to define a large package. This package would involve the European patents. We will work hard to ensure that the member states are ready to sign an agreement with a, on a patent court in October. But of course we all know that this signature cannot uh, take place unless we can agree on the two texts affecting these regulations. Progress has been made with regards to the seat for the European Patents Court, also with regards to eliminating Article 6 of the Regulation on Strengthened Cooperation. <coughs> this has uh, slowed down the adoption of the package. We need to stress that the Council has not yet finished its internal discussions And the Council has decided to have a discussion with you before reaching its conclusions. So I'm grateful that you have postponed your vote on this in plenary because this gives us the time we need to consult the two legislative branches. I am convinced that we all understand that uh, the heads of state and government have struck a very delicate balance and opening the agreement here is, uh, cannot be a precedent. But if there is any subject which uh, requires us to change our habits slightly, it is this particular subject area, which we completed after very difficult discussions, which uh, lasted some 20, 30 years. We hope that we can count on the same spirit of cooperation with the European Parliament so that we can conclude uh, this file as quickly as possible. The EU will become a competitor on the international scene with regards to research and technology. Our goal in the presidency is to take the measures necessary in order to have the first registrations at the beginning of 2014. Another important point is the management 
of intellectual property rights in digital form, restitution and uh, public access. A directive <coughs> could hold common rules with regards to overseeing companies. This is a priority for the Cy Cyprus presidency. We intend to <coughs> examine the Commission's uh, proposals, which will be published on July 11th. This proposal and other patent questions will be the subject of a meeting of the specialized working group, which will take place between September and December. Modernizing and harmonizing rules on a European patent is another subject which uh, requires emergency attention. The first set of rules were established in 1993, and the European Court of Justice has in the meantime handed down rulings on its interpretation. So we need to revise this legal framework. The Commission is proposing to change the legal framework and these proposals should be made to the Council in September. We think that these are very important proposals. We need to modernize our patent offices and its procedures so that we can strengthen the economy. We need to set up an, a safer legal framework. Finally, there is the EU's position with regards to the World Patent Office. We play an important role, and we think it's important for us to steer the discussions towards a new law. We will stress the new conditions which exist with regards to protecting audiovisual organizations and exceptions for those with uh, visual handicaps or who have special needs with regards to printing. We will coordinate this work within uh, meetings of the working group on uh, intellectual property rights. Turning to company law, this is an absolutely necessary condition in order to have a dynamic and modern economy. If we can modernize our rules, we can have a better environment for our companies our companies would thus be more competitive. They will better contribute to economic growth. Company law, accounting, accounting controls, changing the accounting rules should simplify and make final statements more comparable, this should make financial transactions more transparent. Account, preparing account statements is one of the most difficult tasks of companies. It's important to reduce the uh, red tape for small and medium-sized enterprises, but we also need more transparency for companies' payments in the mining and wood sectors.
I'm referring here to the Directive on Consolidated Accounts, which replaces the 60, the previous accounting directives. This is one of the Cyprus Presidency's priorities. We will work towards an agreement with the European Parliament. We think that we can achieve an agreement in the first reading. The Council supports introducing rules on transparency for European companies in the mining and wood sectors. But we need to find a compromise. We need to have a balance between the need for transparency and the need for competitiveness. We're very pleased with uh, our cooperation with you and your rapporteur. in trying to reach an agreement for the first reading. A Cyprus uh, presidency has as a priority proposals to revise accounting rules in order to strengthen the internal market and to create more confidence in final statements. The economic crisis has shown how important this is. We are interested in seeing your report published in September on this subject. As regards the European Foundation, The Foundation <clears throat> serves Europeans, Europe's citizens and should benefit from an additional fund. The proposed regulation for the Foundation, or the fund, aims at creating a unique legal framework for the Foundation. We will work closely with your committee in order to make progress in this very difficult subject. I'd like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your cooperation with regards to orphan works in particular, and I would also like to thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to field any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Well, that's a long list of uh, subjects which uh, interest us very much and uh, where we see very much eye to eye, but there are also some more difficult subjects which will require some more delicate discussions. Karim and Mr. Masip have asked for the floor. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, may I firstly welcome the Minister uh, to our committee today. It's very encouraging that he has taken the time uh, so early on to come and uh, meet with us. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the Cypriot Presidency for uh, already having sent its representatives to come and meet with uh, certainly myself and some, some of my other colleagues. Uh, we as a committee are due in Cyprus uh, next week, I think, Chairman, and so we're quite looking forward to the interactions that will take place there. Uh, as well. Uh, Minister, I wish to put to you three points that weren't directly referred to in the address that uh, you made to us, and I thank you for your rather uh, intensive uh, uh, information that you've passed on to us. Uh, but in view of um, a number of files which are now unexpectedly uh, the responsibility of the Cypriot Presidency, how do you see the progress of the audit dossier? Is it still the hope and intention to reach an agreed approach by the end of your presidency? Uh, and secondly, Minister, later today we're going to be voting on uh, my report regarding uh, better lawmaking, and later still we will have a presentation of the first impact assessment appraisal uh, in uh, jury committee following the establishment of the 
uh, Impact Assessment Directorate in Parliament. Can you confirm whether the Cypriot Presidency will be taking steps to establish an equivalent mechanism in the Council in satisfaction of the inter-institutional agreement? And, Minister, very uh, finally, we have just heard a presentation on the common sales law. Is it perhaps, well, it is perhaps more under the responsibility of the Minister for Justice. However, given your role in relation to commerce, how do you view that particular proposal? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you very much to the Cyprus Presidency for being here this morning. As you know, I am a, very much in favor of the uh, <clears throat> Cypriot position. I am sure I know your country, I know your difficulties. I am sure that you will have a fine presidency, and you could count on me to work with you very closely. Now, you referred to the importance of uh, copyright. My colleague, Mr. Karim, talked about the uh, impact assessment. I'm sure we will discuss that this afternoon, so I won't take that up now. But I would like to say that you referred to the work on patents uh, under preceding presidencies. With all due respect, I must disagree with you, Minister. I think that the patent issue is on the point of failure. There are radical positions by the governments which don't, uh, are not at all satisfactory as far as I'm concerned. I have been on this committee for some time, but I think that uh, the governments with the different positions <clears throat> show that uh, nobody knows where we're going, and that uh, was evident in the last co-repair meeting. Now, contrary to what you said about pre preceding presidencies, if we can move forward <clears throat> in Council, I would suggest the following. Cyprus has shown that it masters English. Uh, you use uh, English as a priority language. So perhaps you, I would suggest that you look at the possibility of unifying all the countries and not marginalizing countries such as Spanish with a, in, an English-only approach. Perhaps you can help to bring the directive home because this is a, a real disaster. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister, I too would like to thank you for coming and meeting with us, and I'd like to thank you for presenting the priority issues for the Cypriot Presidency. I'd like to continue what my colleague Masip said, um, and I would like to ask you for your opinion and your answer. Please do tell us what happened, because we are worried. So many years put into the work, so many efforts by the previous presidencies and the European Parliament as well in order to come up with a sensible solution. And then at the very end, in a situation that uh, where we should you know, finalise the issues where the 
patent tribunal should be located. The Council makes decisions unacceptable to the European Parliament. The Council makes decisions questioning the goodwill to come up with a solution in the first reading. So, Mr Minister, could you, sir, provide us with an answer? Did everyone voting there understand the meaning of those changes? Because if so, then it does not provide us with a positive answer as to the stance of the Council. Because all of this is a really a disturbing situation. It disturbs everything done so far in terms of the European Common Patent. If you could provide us with an answer, we would be most grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I can uh, well remember the uh, discussions we had in the trilogue last year on patents. Article 628, as far as I was concerned, I didn't really care because it just repeated the agreement on the court. But we did say that uh, we wanted to fulfill have rules to fulfill Article 118, and we had to have rules for the court. At the end, we said, fine, then 6 to 8 have to be in. I still don't care whether they are in or not. I don't care whether we need it for the patent right, but... I do care about whether or not we have a rule which will stand up to the Court of Justice. If we want to ridicule 30 years of negotiations, then we need to adopt a rule which the Court of Justice will strike down in its first decision and says that it's not acceptable. So the situation is not very difficult the heads of state and government have decided on legislation against their own uh, powers at a, in a midnight decision. It's quite different <clears throat> when you try to untie the Gordian knot at midnight and you try to get an agreement <coughs> and you ignore years of negotiation, so that has created an extremely difficult situation. We have the problem. Do we use 6 to 8 or aspects of 6 to 8 in order to have a better legal basis? And then we bring the Court of Justice, of course, into play with its interpretation. <clears throat> That's not what the heads of government and state wanted, or we leave it as it is, in which case we probably don't have an agreement. I don't know how we can move forward. I think probably the best thing is to uh, discuss this after the holidays. <clears throat> we'll uh, let talk about this over the holidays and in the hopes that they come up with some bright ideas in September. But uh, there is a majority in this House very interested in uh, having a final agreement. I think that's very obvious. We're going to have to be constructive at the end, but we're not going to be so constructive as to pay the price of our own credibility and uh, have this struck down by the Court of Justice. Mrs. Lichtenberger and then the Minister. Thank you very much. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to follow the debate right from the start because the Transport Committee is sitting at the same time and I had to present an opinion there. Now, the way you've described the dispute, uh, it's become completely crazy from, in my opinion, any policy that would lead to having a European patent that isn't really worth its name, but that cannot actually go to the Court of Justice and may only seek enforcement at national level. Well, that's absolutely unthinkable. It would simply remove any meaning to our rules. 
And I don't really think there are many possibilities. If the council insists on this because of the agreements in the council, then I am very pessimistic about this. I don't really know what we're going to do about it. I'm very critical about the government's position here, and that's because I'm interested in having a genuine European patent that is worthy of its name, because that's the only thing that's going to help us here. So I think we've got to say very clearly that I simply cannot understand what the Council is doing here. It's completely counterproductive, and I hope that the wisdom of the Council will prove me wrong, ultimately, but for the time being, I don't really think the Council is going to be able to get out of the dilemma. I'm very keen to see what solutions are going to be proposed, but I really would warn against simply doing something for the sake of compromise and coming up with a very half-hearted solution. Because a community patent will only be worthy of its name if there are clear, understandable rules. Uh, anything that creates legal uncertainty, anything that leads to grey areas, is simply not the way forward for us here. And this reminds me of um, something we say in Austria. Nothing is more lasting than a compromise. However, if we were to go forward with a compromise and simply come up with a watered-down solution, then in the long run, the compromise would run counter to wanting to set up a European patent, and it would clash with the spirit of the Convention. And I really don't think it would help within APO. Now, we can't have an organisation issuing patents and controlling them at the same time. That's why we have a separation of powers in a democracy. And that's why we have supervisory bodies that are not the same bodies as those actually taking the decisions. So there's absolutely no way we can accept the current thrust of things because it would make the rules even more complicated. And then when it comes to the separation of three distinct units. Well, at the start, there was a lot of objection. It wasn't considered a good idea. And people felt that there shouldn't be different uh, departments. Nevertheless, that's what people pursued, uh, this three-way split. And the conclusion was that if something is more straightforward in a particular country, then they could decide on one kind of patent and then in another country where there's a more generous approach, that's where people will go for other patents and again that that would be a way of circumventing the key idea. Now, I have no understanding for the Council's approach here. Again, I really don't see a way out of this dilemma. I think the responsibility is clearly on the shoulders of the Council, not us. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Wikström, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, thank you very much, Minister, for coming to us in the European Parliament. Uh, everyone's talking about patents, and this is something that obviously we are very occupied with.
And we need to look back to the past to understand where we're going to go in the future. We need to look back to understand why we had a union in the first place. It's a union based on sharing common values, where it wasn't the idea of bringing countries together, but rather bringing people together. And we have decided to split the court into three different groups. Now, there are 40 people, and there is an issue about where the headquarters is going to be. Now, we're happy with it, but obviously it's not an ideal solution. Now, in Europe, we know the criticisms that are levied against the Parliament for having two different seats, Brussels and Strasbourg, and now we're talking about three different seats, so I think that's regrettable. But maybe we should first of all look at what's positive here. And if we do that, then we can see that we've made some progress. And we have a proposal here that is good for large companies, small companies, for a lot of entities alike, people who've waited almost four decades for the European patent. So we do need to look at the plus points. We need to focus on what's positive and not simply pick out uh, what's wrong with it. So we have made some progress. I think in the Parliament we can be proud that in a period of four months we've been able to draw up three reports that have garnered a great deal of consensus. Now, there might be different reasons why the Council has reacted in a different way. Now, it might be because of the crisis. And, in fact, uh, there hasn't been a discussion of ideology, but I think we should see this as a good start, that it's something new. And in this committee, we have detailed discussions of patents, but I, I don't think I'm going to go into the detail now. That's something we'll do later. But to do have a plea for you, please don't lose sight in the Council of the fact that we want to have a, a uniform Europe here that uh, agrees on a lot of elements. Now, it's about uh, ideology and conviction trying to get rid of differences and build confidence. Today, we simply can't afford to keep getting bogged down in wrangling between the different institutions. No, I think we've got to be clear about where we're going and we've got to try and move forward. And I think we have to be proud that we have been able to come together, not to pit ourselves one against the other, but rather to have a single European peoples in different member states. Now, you should bear that in mind. Please bear that in mind next time you're in the Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I think it's perfectly normal for our debate to touch on the issue of the patents in the court and that's why I'd like to thank all the members, Mr Zivka, Mrs Lichtenberger, Mrs Wickstrom, so all of you who've raised the issue. Nonetheless, I think I'll start off by commenting on what Mr Lena has said. We are facing a difficult situation, but we do have a little bit of time ahead of us with the summer break for the legal services to look at the issue and to look at how we can actually come up with a feasible solution. Now, it's no coincidence that in my opening remarks, I said that it is not normal to have uh, parallel advances when it comes to procedure. Nevertheless, this work has been going on for years, so we can't leave it now. Just because of some shortcomings, we cannot uh, simply ignore now the fruits of our work. 
Uh, there are disparities in terms of procedure. In fact, let me say that the presidency of the council is going to work very hard with you because we consider this to be very important for Europe. It's important for all of us. In fact, let me reiterate what Mrs. Vickstrom said. In the Cyprus Presidency, we are making efforts and we understand that we need to maintain diversity within a unified Europe. Now, although we're a small country, we are a bridge, effectively, and I think we can have a better Europe if we have more Europe. And more Europe means that we'll be able to arrive at compromises where we have particularly thorny issues to deal with and where it seems that it's impossible to overcome the situation. Now, we all understand the fact that we need the single patent office or court, but we know that there are still problems. So I think it's a question of goodwill, and I would like to thank the European Parliament for having postponed the debate and vote in plenary because that will give us time to reach a solution, as Mr Lena said. Now, turning to the other issues that have been raised, particularly by Mr Karim. <coughs> On the issue of impact assessment... This is something where the Cypriot Presidency would like to increase the safeguards in accounting and disclosure of information. Our aim is for these two proposals to be brought forward. These are complementary, after all. We are going to f try to cooperate very closely with the Council the Commission and the European Parliament to arrive at a solution. All the documents drafted by the European Parliament will be taken into consideration when we look at the proposals. As far as controls or audits are concerned, now it's very difficult to complete those before the end of the presidency. The regulation and directive need to work in parallel. That's absolutely essential for companies and for Europe. So we're going to try to promote these two dossiers. Now, those were the replies that I wanted to give you. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? doesn't seem to be the case. So I'd like to thank the Minister. I'd like to wish you and the Cyprus Presidency all the best. All I can say is that we will do our very best to contribute to the next six months being a success. So thank you very much. We've got the votes at 11 o'clock. We can't vote earlier, and I don't think there'd be any point doing anything now. So I'll suspend the meeting, and we'll start again at 11 with the votes. Please make sure you've got your voting cards with you. So if you don't have it, you've got five or ten minutes to go and get it.
So, meine sehr verehrten Colleagues, it's 11 o'clock now, so we can proceed to the votes. The first one is the report from Mr. Karim. Would you like to comment, Mr. Karim? Do you have any remarks you'd like to make, or can we start voting? Okay. Good. The Secretariat... Good. I've been told by the Secretariat there's a consensus, so we can take the whole package on block. Are there any objections to that? Doesn't seem to be the case. So, uh, one single vote. We'll take the whole thing as a package for this opinion, including all the amendments. Those in favour, please show. Raise your hand. Those against? Abstentions? With two abstentions, it's carried. Congratulations, Mr. Karim. So the next item from our colleague Messaros. Now, I haven't been told by the Secretariat uh, that there's a consensus here, so we're going to have to go through it individually. Let's proceed as usual. I'm not going to count any abstentions unless... Anyone wants to comment, uh, but we'll count the abstentions at the end. So, Amendment 1, Rapporteur in favour. Against. Carried. Amendment 2, in favour. Against. Carried. Compromise 1, uh, in favour. Against. Carried. Amendment 4, in favour. Against. Adopted. Amendment 5 in favour. Against. Adopted. Compromise 2 in favour. Against. Adopted. It says 7 here. That's a mistake, though. Amendment 7 in favour. Against. Adopted. 8 in favour. Against. Adopted. Compromise 3 in favour. Against. Adopted. Amendment 10 in favour. Against. Adopted. 11 in favour. Against. Adopted. Amendment 12 in favour. Against. Adopted. Compromise 4 in favour. Against. Adopted. Compromise 5 in favour. Against. Adopted. Compromise 6 in favour. Against. Two against, so it's adopted with a majority. Sixteen in favour. Against, adopted. Seventeen in favour. Against, adopted. Compromise seven in favour. Against, adopted. Nineteen in favour. Against, adopted. Twenty in favour. Against, Adopted. 21 in favour. Against. Adopted. 22 in favour. Against. Adopted. 24 in favour. Against. Adopted. 25 in favour. Against. Rejected. 26 in favour. Against. Rejected. 29 in favour. Against. Rejected. 30 in favour. Against. Rejected. 34 in favour. Against. Adopted. 35 in favour. Against. Rejected. 36 in favour. Against. Rejected. 39 in favour. 
against rejected the opinion as a whole in favor against abstentions two abstentions the rest are in favor so it's adopted this brings us on to the second Misaros report compromise one in favor against adopted 14 in favor against there was a majority against 14 we just voted on 14 the majority was against then amendment 2 in favor against adopted 15 in favor against adopted 16 in favor against adopted compromise 2 in favor against adopted 18 in favor against rejected 19 in favor against adopted 5 in favor against adopted 20 in favor against adopted 21 in favor against adopted 22 in favor against rejected compromise 3 in favor against one was against it's adopted 24 in favor against it's rejected 5 in favor against adopted 7 in favor against adopted 8 in favor against adopted 9 in favor against adopted compromise 4 in favor against adopted 11 in favor against adopted 12 in favor against adopted the opinion as a whole in favor against abstentions adopted unanimously congratulations to the rapporteur and now the Sievka report we can vote on to do that I think everything's fine five has been withdrawn 21 Stoinoff in favor against let's do it again in favor 21 against so it was adopted six in favor against adopted 22 in favor against adopted seven in favor against adopted eight in favor against adopted nine in favor against adopted compromise one in favor against adopted 11 in favor against adopted 12 in favor against adopted 24 in favor against adopted compromise two in favor against adopted compromise three in favor against adopted 15 in favor against adopted 16 in favor against adopted 18 in favor against rejected 17 in favor against adopted one in favor against one then in favor against adopted now Rapkai's right actually we shouldn't have voted on one you were completely right so the vote on one didn't happen 19 strong off in favor against adopted two in favor against adopted three in favor 
against adopted now four ignore 20 in favor against adopted now the opinion as a whole in favor against abstentions adopted unanimously congratulations to the rapporteur this now brings us on to petitions or other orphan works Mrs. Goering, do you want to say anything? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to give you an update on concluding negotiations with the, with the Council and with uh, the Danish, at that point, presidency concerning authorized use of orphan works. As you probably know, we concluded negotiations with the Council on the 6th of uh, June. The compromise was adopted at the meeting of Coraper on the 14th of uh, June. Uh, later on, the European Commission uh, decided to uh, complement the entire dossier, and at the end of June, we, we received the entire file, so we have a uh, single uniform document, a very good document, I believe. I think the compromise that we have managed to hammer out is very good. So, again, I would like to thank all the shadow rapporteurs for very good constructive approach. And uh, it, it really has helped us to uh, arrive at a very good, uh, coherent uh, text. And I'm very happy about that. So basically today is our last uh, debate on the subject. The vote is to happen at the plenary in September. And today I wanted to request that you adopt this uh, compromise text, which in my opinion is a very good, useful document. And I already have uh, uh, certain, some evidence because both uh, libraries and archives that I have contacted are very happy about the text. I will be definitely using it in the future. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Mrs. Lichtenberg, please. I have to admit that I'm rather disappointed by the result because ultimately what we expected, that it's not really going to help accessibility, it's only going to be under certain conditions, under certain national conditions, and it's going to be very difficult to have access. If we begin like this with the reform of the IPR, that at European level we decide that anyone can do whatever they want when it comes to the member states, then we're not really having European rules. And I know it was very difficult to negotiate, and I know that the rapporteur has made a great deal of effort to bring the Parliament's position through. However, I have to say quite honestly that if the Council continues like this, then we're not going to achieve our goals. For example, when it comes to harmonization of exceptions. So I'm really very disappointed with the way that the Council is dealing with this. And I think that we should stick to uh, what we actually wanted to achieve. And I think we've got to admit that this won't achieve it. Formal. Thank you. We, have, we don't have to vote on it formally today. We just have to have been informed about it. So we have been informed according to Rule 70, and this will then go to the plenary under first reading. Mrs. Geringer. I do understand certain level of disappointment expressed by the Greens. However, I would not agree with the statement that it was a very difficult legislative act. Quite on the contrary, I think it makes things easier. We are uh, opening up the possibility to use orphan works, which so far could not have been used. So it's obviously a difficult step, but it's a first step. It has been made, and hopefully, after difficult negotiations, new wave of negotiations will be much easier. I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think that today we should say yes to this document, and we should just give it a possibility to see how it work, works out in practice. Well, yeah, <coughs> 
I'd also like to give my view because Lydia has managed to achieve something that at times we thought we weren't going to achieve. So we do have a result today and we're going to pass it on to the plenary. Now, if we're able to get the vote in the first reading and if the council doesn't change its attitude once again, which unfortunately we're seeing them do uh, again and again. Now, the fact that we have a European directive on orphan works is something new. So we should be aware of that. In Europe, you can't just take sudden big steps forward. So it's those steps that might seem to be unsatisfactory, but nevertheless they do help bring things along. Now, if we're able to make sure that maybe not in all the states, but at least in the most advanced states, uh, digitized orphan works in some form and online consultation, obviously that's progress. Now, of course, we're not 100% satisfied either, and I completely, completely understand what Ava has said. However, that shouldn't uh, prevent us from looking at what has been achieved here. So I'd actually like to congratulate Lydia for the work she's done and everyone else who's contributed. Thank you, Thank you Madam Tyne. Yes, I'd also like to confirm that for the Liberals that we thought that negotiations were very difficult, they were very long-winded, and I think it was a smaller area that we started with but then over the months we seemed to be negotiating forever and ever and there were so many trialogues I think with orphan works and patents we've had the most trialogues and then we were able to bring that to a good conclusion when obviously we had included PPP so that all libraries and institutes and so on would also have the opportunity to have assistance from the private sector and to be able, therefore, to under undertake digitization. And we thought things went too complicated. We uh, drafted a program with the Commission, but then things did become a little bit more complicated for films. But as regards books, I think we could say that, yes, they would all be digitized. And I think the rapporteur has really... Uh, been able to do a good job with all the different versions, bring them all together. Yes, on behalf of the EPP, I'd also like to add my support for Madame Beringer, who has done all she could to achieve a result. This is a result of a census. It wasn't always completely satisfactory, but I do think uh, that we have made a huge step forward, and I think we can uh, give our support to her. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, Mr. Engstrom. Yes, I, I'd like to express my, my disappointment with this directive. I have been working very, very close together with the libraries. They are very, very unhappy with this. They consider this directive to be uh, completely useless or almost completely useless. So, so I mean, if there, is a con if there is a large majority to, to let this opportunity pass by, as there seems to be, well, that's the, you know, that's the case, but I think it's very, very sad because this is not going to help ma making the European common cultural heritage available, unfortunately, the way it is drafted at the moment. So I would urge everybody to reconsider if we could take this to a second reading, have a proper discussion about it, because at, at, at the moment it simply isn't useful, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've uh, looked at that. So Article 70 has been fulfilled, and that will go to plenary, and then plenary will have the last word on that, as is always the case. Okay, I think, therefore, we can leave 21, and then we come to this case of the letter from the petition committee. Are there any objections to that? If that's not the case, then we can have that. Okay, Mr Speroni, please. 
Now, I don't really have any objections as such, but I wasn't able to find anything in the documents, so I can't really express a view. 22 wasn't in the file, so I'm afraid I have no idea what we're talking about. I think that was the letter. I think that should have been distributed. If it wasn't distributed, then I'd ask for that to take place at a later point, but I think it has been given out. It was sent by email. Okay, well then, Mr. Speroni, I'm sure we could send that to you again and we'll look at that and vote on it at a later point, perhaps in the afternoon. I don't mind. No, I... No, I found it. It wasn't in the file, but sometimes uh, it's a bit difficult to find the right document, so uh, I withdraw my objections. Sorry about that. OK, thank you. So there are no objections. Then we can uh, agree on that in that form, and then we'll come to the legal basis, and then we start with the establishment of an action programme for customs in the European Union for the period 2014 to 2020, and Mr. Foss has the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Here in the proposal for a regulation, we're talking about the new customs and taxation program, Fiscus for 2014-2010. The predecessor program was Customs and Fiscalis, and they were set out in two different legislative acts, and the Parliament and the Council wanted here to look at that, and in May, the Conference of Presidents decided to have two reports on that. And the Council requested that as well, and now the Commission wants to also have uh, two approaches and proposals there. So IMCO in July is going to look at the legal basis and looking at the distribution of uh, the proposals. And the previous proposal for both issues is based on a double legal basis. That's Article 33 and Article 114. So Article 33 is dealing with measures to do with uh, customs cooperation and 114 is uh, looking about administrative and legal regulations for the functioning of the single market. Therefore, this proposal has two important regulation objectives and Article 33 and Article 1. One for are the appropriate legal bases for the original fiscus proposal from the Commission. Given the new texts and situation at the moment, we can't currently assess that, but we just say that Article 33 and Article 114 are also therefore relevant for the customs and the taxation part. And at the moment, we could only say that both of these articles are the appropriate uh, double legal basis. However, given the announcement of the uh, previous proposal, we're going to have to look at the text again. And that's why I would recommend that our committee at the moment um, responds to IMCO and said that it would be necessary, as we had said, as soon as we have this to look at those uh, proposals. I think that's wise advice, so we'll, yes, we'll put that off. OK. We'll postpone that, yes. So we can come on to the second point, which is the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. So it's Mr Foss again. So here we're talking about the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development, and this proposal is based on Article 42 and Article 43 of the Treaty. And AGRI now is asking us about our opinion for making the legal basis more precise. So looking at Article 42 and Article 43, Power 2. The appropriateness of the legal basis is not something that uh, AGRI is against, but they would like it to be more precise. And Article 43 is about the application of competitiveness laws. And then 43.2 forms the actual legal basis for common agricultural policy, as we have often seen in the ordinary legislative procedure. And then it's actually Article 42 that is addressed overall in the Commission proposal that regulates other things. So I would propose or recommend that 
Article 42 and Article 43 2 are confirmed as relevant legal basis there. Thank you. Any objections? No? Okay, so we can uh, say that we've uh, concluded on that as well. Let me just look at the order again. Jetzt haben wir den Punkt 38. So now we've got 30A. Oh no, we've postponed that. Okay, we can get rid of that. So 25, that's the recast. So Madam Lichtenberg. The motion was, uh, was, was uh, uh, postponed, but uh, we have the legal service here, and we could <coughs> hear the legal service's opinion on that because it's about fisheries policy and it is about uh, exemptions more or less for outermost regions. So there is a legal opinion on that, and this is, I think, very interesting. So we can vote uh, uh, next time, but I, I think it would be interesting for the people just to hear the legal opinion on that uh, because it is a uh, complicated issue, but I think, um, well, Anyway, it would be good to hear the legal opinion. If uh, you could ask them, please, for having some word on that. My question is that is the legal service able to do that today, or should we leave that to September instead? No? Perhaps it would be possible then to leave also this discussion for September, because we had understood that uh, then the we point the uh, was postponed. Okay. Okay, well, we'll do that then. So if you're not prepared, then my proposal, Madam Lichtenberger, would be that we leave that to September. Yes, that's right, but if they're not uh, in a position to do that, okay. Well, then let's move on to 25. That's the uh, recast. So, Lopez Estores, please, you have the floor. No? Okay, nothing. Nothing to say there. Everything's uh, there in writing. What do my notes say then? Yeah, passt alles. Keine Probleme. Okay, there aren't any problems there. So if there aren't any objections, then I think we can uh, assume that that's also concluded. Okay. Yeah, we have only here. Well, in any case. I think we've postponed public procurement. That's not on the agenda anymore. Then Mr. Balthazar's report, we've uh, postponed that. So we've got patents. So the council isn't here yet. And Mr. Panella is also not here yet. So I think the head of the legal service as well as the Council. I think we should wait for them to be present and then we can start. Is there anything else we need to deal with? No, I think everything else is for this afternoon. So I think we just have to have a short break for a quarter of an hour until everything uh, comes back as planned. We should, uh, we should also vote on the waiver of the immunity. No, we can't. No? No. No, the problem is that we need to be back in camera to do that. And we've also got the hearing, of course, of Madame Corrie Langen. So it's not technically possible. I don't think there's anything else on the agenda that it makes sense to look at now. Perhaps we could look at 35, but I don't know if all the shadow rapporteurs are present. That's the Madam Lichtenberger's report. We could perhaps look at that. That's not going to take too long. Madam Lichtenberger, would you agree with that? Yeah, that is wahrscheinlich schnell erledigt. Yeah, so that's probably something we could deal with fairly quickly. And 36, that's something that would be dealt with quite quickly as well. Okay, we machen also weiter. We have a Tagesordnungspunkt. Okay, we found an item on the agenda that we can look at now, so let's move on with that. Dann hat auch gleich Frau Lichtenberger das Wort. So I'd like to give the floor to Madam Lichtenberger. I know we're improvising a little bit, but 
go along with things. Sorry, there are so many opinions and reports at the moment. And uh, it's difficult to know all the different items of the agenda off by heart. But this regulation is, of course, an opinion that we are providing for further consideration. And we, above all in this area, need to very much focus on, firstly, what legal materials are playing a role in this sector and also what does need to be considered in this area, as well as the decisive question of uh, liability when there are accidents or major impacts of these activities. Therefore, my main approach was to uh, afford as much precision as possible into this. First of all, we're trying to make sure that we have Amendment 2. That's something that's very important, and that needs to be checked sufficiently from the outset. We need to make sure that if someone receives a contract that in a case of doubt they are able to pay if there were damages to be paid. So that's something that we wanted to look at right from the outset with the differences in capacity because we have seen with some events that it's very risky at times and then someone does receive a contract that is in a position to have the relevant insurance or to take on the tasks if, for instance, there were damages that were caused by them. That's a vital point. The second very important point is that in the whole of the sector we need to look at the best available technology and rely on that. Oh, best available techniques, rather. So we need to make sure that what we have anchored in most countries, for instance, the principles of best available techniques, sometimes we also call it state of the art. We need to make sure that that is set out in the relevant systems so that it's stipulated so that we don't see uh, old-fashioned technology being uh, used that have in the past uh, been shown to cause accidents and problems. And just also the financial reliability and uh, capacity of businesses, that's something that is a set out in my proposals for amendments and also in the EU we need to set out the fact that in environmentally f sensitive maritime areas as well we need to have special attention paid to the protection for instance of not just marine environments but coastal environments this can have devastating effects not just for fisheries but also for tourism I have mentioned here all specific uh, protection areas in the maritime sector and there's a relevant directive there, which is the Habitats and Birds Directive. Here there's a general trend to have environmental legislation, but often it's not taken into consideration or it's dealt with in a way so that damages do occur and it's then difficult to find out who needs to pay for that. So I think I'll basically leave it at that for the time being. And I think it, we're trying to really point out that there are certain protection objectives and there are 
economic and environmental aspects to take into consideration as well, and that needs to be looked at right from the beginning so that we don't uh, just look at those after a disaster has taken place. And also accidents and the series of accidents that we've seen in this area and the damages that have occurred. Well, the countries that are affected often their coasts are affected, but they're involved in legal proceedings for many, many years until they have uh, received the relevant damages paid to them. So I think we need to really work preventively, and what I've set out in this report is that we do need to have this preventive character, not just looking towards environmental aspects, but also the financial aspects and uh, making sure we don't have those potential damages and dealing with those properly. Thank you very much. Anybody who would like to take the floor? No. The deadline for amendments, according to the proposal from the Secretariat, is the 19th of July. No objections, so we can conclude on that. So I think we've got the Council and the Legal Service present again, so I'd say that... Our colleague takes the floor on that point. Okay, thank you. Well, I think you're all aware of this. I don't think you need to point out too much beforehand. So even with the Cyprus presidency and the decision of the heads and state of government has been defended and we had a discussion on that, I'm not going to take part in that discussion because if I do take part, well I think I've already accepted the first step, so myself I'm not going to accept the expertise but the legitimate uh, approach that it's deemed legitimate, so that's the first point then I think there are some very questionable issues uh, looking at what's happened and I think it goes so far beyond the patent issue so the first point is the subject matter. I think that the Secretariat sent all of the members the uh, first opinion there from our legal service. So you're all aware of that. And in the conclusion, it's quite clear there. I think in 22C, our colleague Pereira makes it quite clear that deleting the three articles isn't compatible with EU law because it means that it's not compatible with Article 118, which is the legal basis, the only legal basis there. So if you delete the three articles, we no longer have the right legal basis because the legal basis states that we've got a pattern with harmonised protection in the ordinary legislative procedure and then if the uh, article that stipulates that is no longer there I think it's quite clear I don't think this is the first time that we've discussed this we've also seen this in negotiations in council and it's quite interesting in fact or perhaps it's not interesting at all but the decision there of the heads of state and government is not really a factual decision. It's rather just a horse trading. And the central chamber of the new patent court, well, there were three applicants for the seat, and I think that was the only point that we seemed to have to discuss again and again for months. That was always on the agenda, and it wasn't taken out at all. So... We said we could talk about fortune, the fact that luckily there weren't any further member states who wanted to have the seat, otherwise we have eight seats. And then that all led to where the European Council would have any competencies after this. That wasn't intervening with legislation, that's as stated in Article 15. So. They were saying that's what they were demanding, but of course people in the European Council, they were saying that if the European Council says that, well, we need to uh, enforce that and go along with it. That's what's uh, been stated with the legislation. So, as we said, 
in negotiations. We talked about that on many a, an occasion, and we never really, during negotiations, heard whether it would make sense or not. But it, in fact, on the contrary, in the negotiations in council, we asked the legal service. I think there was a letter from the legal service of the commission to uh, our colleague Vikström, and uh, those demands were set out in that. And as a rapporteur, although it didn't really reflect my political will, but I did say, well, in negotiations, let's look at all things on the agenda, let's talk about everything, and what has been received as amendments. And we also talked about this issue. It was clear that we couldn't go forward in that way as regards European legislation. And also, the legal service from the Council did agree on that, but only because they didn't have to intervene against that. So that was their position. It was always quite clear. And if you remember the discussions that we had in negotiations before, that wasn't controversial between the Council and Parliament at all. So it's not a factual decision, as I said. It's just a horse trading. And I would be interested in seeing, and we need to really demand this as well, whether this is something that we do need to discuss to make sure that we can finalise and implement what was decided by the heads of state and government, because then we need to ask the council why they're doing that. They can't just leave that out, and they can't just say we've just decided this. They need to have the uh, factual basis of a decision. So that's quite clear. And all those people who... Uh, from the perspective of European legislation and looking at this, they're saying that it's uh, quite clearly not compatible. There's a, a range of reasons that anyone with common sense can uh, see that it's not compatible. So this is something we need to regulate. We need to have some regulatory content, but if you have that, you need to say what you want to regulate. If you take that content out, and then you've got, not got anything to regulate. So we've got this regulation, but if that's not the case, then we're not going to be able to see it being effective at all. So you need to look at the factual parts of this, rather than just discussing this as part of horse trading. And then, of course, this is something that's quite explicit. It's, we've got the European Court of Justice. And so I think we made this quite clear. And they want to have disempowerment. I think that's quite uh, clear. And that's an interesting approach because we are aware of the assessment of the Court of Justice that in 2009-2010, at the request of the Council, they were requested by the Council to produce an opinion about the legal system, which was an, originally a Commission's proposal, on whether that was compatible with EU law. And the Court said, well, it's not compatible on many points. And they also said that in fact, that was, that was the preliminary ruling, and it would really make sense. I don't think there's any other practical solution. If we really just look at those different legal systems, but that's what's being done, and I can see that we're looking at the regulation again, and we're trying to do exactly what the ECJ had looked at, for instance, taking away the competences. So I think it's quite clear that they'd have to have an appeal immediately, and I'm sure that will happen. But that's a political approach with saying that. And if the interested parties outside the EU look at that, well, then I, I don't think it will be respected. But that's the case, and everyone has a right to their own opinion. 
But when an institution says that, whether it's the European Council or the Council itself, then it's a most remarkable thing indeed. And the task of the European Parliament is not to help violate EU law and to violate constitution and treaties, but to protect them. Of course, at the end of the day, this is the job of the Court of Justice, but the legislator must do this as well. And if the Court of Justice is to, not to be allowed to protect the treaties, then it's up to other institutions, institutions to protect, allow it to protect what is in the treaty. So this is a very remarkable political proceeding. And <clears throat> we, I have a question. I have looked at this, and I came across number nine. I <clears throat> fully realized that a text is uh, valid when it's decided upon by the right body. For us, that's the plenary and the council in whatever form. But we have an agreement. A regula the text of a regulation, we have not just agreed to this, we've voted on this. As of the 2nd of December, there is a letter from Co-Repair on, in the, on behalf of the Council <clears throat> to the Legal Affairs Committee saying... If the European Parliament decides on the annex word for word, then the Council commits also to decide on this word for word, the same text. So the question arises, is this, is this paper worth anything, the paper that we've received in the last few weeks? I understand legally what's in point nine, but there's a bit more than this. If this were the case, then we could uh, suspend any number of informal trilogues because they would be pointless. And I want to add another point. As rapporteur, I had to prepare all this, so perhaps I'm very sensitive about this. But after receiving the reassurances of co repair, in the name of Council. So it's not just co-repair. The co-repair spoke on behalf of the Council, for the Council, is exactly what it said in the letter. With that reassurance, we trusted that, and we voted then, and we voted word for word on what we had agreed upon. And I had my own proposals as a rapporteur, which I withdrew. <clears throat> colleagues made proposals which I thought should be supported but I said we have a re recommendation and they followed this I said as rapporteur we can't vote on this because that would affect the compromise so we took a decision in the committee on false, pre uh, false premises now, let me be very clear. If the Council wanted to delete these three points, then it wouldn't be just a point of the three points, but also the overall compromise. You can't say, well, all right, everything that we agreed upon we take, but then except for these three points, so we set those aside, and then everything else we'll, we'll, we'll negotiate. That's... There's no, there's no negotiation at that point, as far as I'm concerned. I would say we just stick in the, in the committee. So in a case of doubt, we would have to go back to the phase of the draft report with uh, amendments proposed by our colleagues. That's what we would have to do. I must say, at this stage, <clears throat> we've only been able to have few contacts where we've only had uh, content discussions. <clears throat> it's been very, I must say, uh, good that we've been able to discuss this with the Cypriot Cyprus presidency. 
This was on Co-Repair's agenda last Tuesday, and they wanted to decide to eliminate these three articles. And because of the Cyprus presidency, this decision was suspended. They had a decision, that's fine with me, but they didn't take any decision. And then they talked about the procedure, and the Cyprus presidency has told me that, uh, well, what's the, that they asked... What's the point of getting a reassurance from the council? But uh, I trusted when the presidency said we don't want an, a, a decision. I must be very clear that when the, if the council were to do this, then it would be our mutual uh, trust, which would be the first victim. So that's how I see the situation. Like others, like our chairman, I have had, uh, I've received any number of letters over the past few days, but nothing has changed. Some people feel falsely. <clears throat> that the Court of Justice isn't competent. And other people have said, well, it's reasonable if we take this out. But all those who have some familiarity with European law say this is not feasible. We are adopting a regulation which is invalid legally. And as a result of this, at this point, I can only recommend and call upon the committee that that the <clears throat> we shouldn't make a political decision once we have a legal position then I think we could take a political decision so it would be a good idea I think <clears throat> If we allow the legal service to continue its work, and I'm grateful for what it's done already, so that we can have a, a fuller, its fuller opinion after the holidays, and then we can think about uh, how we should proceed from there. Thank you. Well... This is uh, taking us back to the position after the holidays last year. We had a long internal discussions about this because we had different opinions, and then we were able to clarify the situation with the help of the legal service, and all the legal services agreed that this wouldn't work. Now I have four requests for the floor. We, of course, want to hear from the uh, Cyprus presidency and the legal service. I suggest we take the four colleagues' comments first, and I would ask Mr. Penera that he presents his position, and then we can deal with the issues raised by our colleagues, and then I'll give the possibility to the Cyprus presidency to explain his position. Mrs. Beekstrom first. Thank you, Chair. I fully understand. Micro. I fully understand the irritation of, of colleagues in this case, and especially of you, Mr. Rapkai, as rapporteur, to find the first reading deal broken by the European Council, <clears throat> especially in the way it was done after a session of the worst sort of closed doors horse trading between capitals, when national prestige overrule common good of Europe and EU citizens. This is a shame. It has been a complicated dossier and we are handling it in ways that are a bit different from most other dossiers. We have a huge package in this case with an international <coughs> agreement, a co-decision um, co decision regulation and consultation regulation all wrapped up in an enhanced cooperation being negotiated in a fast track first reading trialogue. This is very special. 
We have this complex situation for, for two reasons. <coughs> the proposal has been very controversial for decades, and it's extremely important for European com competitiveness. When we concluded a deal with the Council on the unitary patent regulation last December, I was happy that we had come finally to an agreement. I was of course not pleased with all aspects of it, as colleagues will remember that I had proposed elements that were eventually not taken on board in the agreement with the Council. <coughs> nevertheless, <coughs> nevertheless, I and the Liberal group of this House continued continuously to support the creation of a unitary patent. But the part, this time part of the midnight deal happened to turn out in a way that I personally support on substance. That is, of course, the deletion of Articles 6, 7 and 8. But I am fully aware that the situation could, as well, has been the opposite. No member of this Parliament, myself included, should be happy with this deal in the European Council independently of what we may have thought about the substance of the matter. And the European Council should indeed know better than to meddle with the first reading agreement between Parliament and Council. What is otherwise an agreement worth? On the substance of the matter, the Liberal Group would have supported a European patent with Articles 6, 7 and 8 in the regulation even if this is not what we had wanted in the first place. Indeed, we demonstrated this already in the vote here in committee in December. Naturally, on substance, we would also be happy to support a U European patent without them, since I have argued for the, their exclusion from the regulation during the entire process here in this very committee. I do not think that today is the moment for me to go back into the substance of the arguments for or against the deletion of the articles. It deserves, it deserves indeed a much more in-depth discussion. We, I could do it if you would <coughs> like to later on, but the most important now in my mind is to work flexibly, creatively towards a common solution and do it quickly. The goal of reaching an agreement with Council <laughs> However immature and stubborn the reaction may be, has to come in the first place now. I understand there is a lot of irritation at, at the behaviour, but my plea to every one of the colleagues in this committee, not take out our frustrations with them on the citizens, the SMEs in Europe and the entrepreneurs and citizens <coughs> everywhere. <laughs> we can simply not afford a failure at this point. Europe is in crisis and we have been elected to provide concrete solutions to, their to Europe's problem. It will not be easy, but I hope that together we can find a way to finally bring this issue to a final conclusion, because citizens simply deserve it. Let's now, as a colleague Rapkai has already stated, use the summer for reflection. Let's come back in <laughs> September with some more energy and maybe a little bit more creativity and sort this out once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This Clanders, please. Sí, muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Chairman. I think everyone knows the position of the Spanish delegation, EPP. And I think everyone knows that uh, the uh, socialist, the Spanish delegation, the socialist group also shares the same view. We're, of course, opposed to this agreement. It's not just because it creates a unitary patent court, but because of the irregularities and the uh, inconsistencies in this whole procedure, which uh, we have. Uh, denounced and want to take to the Court of Justice. Other languages are being left aside, such as Spanish, which uh, represent millions of people. 
So we're not going to shed crocodile tears at this point. We realize that we are in a minority and that the Council has taken a position unanimously to delete 6 to 8, Article 6 to 8. The Parliament's legal service has said that this deletion means that the patent is without content. The that means that there is no proper legal basis. We have consistently said that this is against the creation of the internal market as legal basis. So we're concerned about the the discussions on the seat have taken six months. That's longer than it took to discuss the patent itself. This satisfies no one and it's only dealing with the national interest behind the proposals. This does not elevate the discussion, ladies and gentlemen. On the contrary, we listened to the Council on the 20th and 29th of June, and we listened to the, count, the Parliament Legal Service. But the question is, how are we going to move out of this chaos? Thank you. The Commission is also against this. Jonathan Fowle is here, and I welcome you here, and I will give him the opportunity to explain the Commission's position a bit later. Our colleague Masse. Thank you, Chairman. I simply want to agree with uh, my colleague, who just, just now spoke. Thank you very much. Well, that's uh, short and sweet. Mr. Baltazar. Thank you, Chairman. I think that we need to go back to the priorities of this issue. And the first point is that this is creating a serious political precedent. The European Council does not have any competence nor right to interfere in a legislative procedure that's been conducted by two co-legislators, namely the Council of Ministers and the Parliament. Under the Polish presidency, we'd already arrived at an agreement, and I have to say that the Parliament was very realistic and pragmatic, accepting a whole range of conditions from the Member States. So, quite frankly, the intervention we've seen in the last few dates in the last few days does not have any legal basis. Nevertheless, I do think we have to try to find a solution. And the main concerns are that EU law should be respected, and secondly, that there should be a clear, transparent procedure which is in the hands of the Parliament and the Council of Ministers. So, to conclude, we've always taken a pragmatic approach to try to achieve a result, and we have been waiting for 30 years now to get this result. And companies and industry at large would very much like to see a unitary patent finally seeing the light of day, moving away from all the personal interests at stake here. A lot of amendments were actually lost during the negotiation phase. But we did find a point of an agreement, and I think it's now our duty to find a point of agreement following the intervention that changes three important articles. Now, I think this happens at a crucial time. Now, I don't think this is the right place here to discuss the linguistic issues, although that's very important. I understand the Spanish position, I understand the concerns of my government. But uh, if 90% of Italian companies are presenting their applications for patents in English, 2% in French, 1% in German, that means that the language issue is not really a problem anymore. There is an awareness that uh, the business world has one single language in Europe, and obviously the problem is to use that language worldwide. So I don't really think this is the right place to be discussing these kinds of issues. 
I very much hope that the Parliament will pursue this project because I think it's absolutely fundamental for innovation and uh, a lot of people are calling for it. And I hope that we can continue to be pragmatic and arrive at a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Lichtenberger. Well, I can only fully endorse uh, Mr. Rabkai's uh, analysis. A rule is being uh, deprived of all sense, and this uh, ignores what was said in the beginning as to the original goal, which is that we wanted to improve the situation in Europe, and I want to repeat all of that. We have heard hundreds of declarations from the Council as to how important all of this is. Now, if, as the result of horse trading, the whole content is stripped away from the proposal, then it's pointless. I think we have to think about whether or not we can go back to square one and have a new start if there is no solution, if the main, the, the heart of the proposal is taken out, and if this is offered as a compromise, which is only a half solution and creates enormous legal uncertainty. If we do that, we're doing the opposite of what was intended in the beginning. I am interested in having a true European patent, and uh, Mr. Baldessari is absolutely right. It's not really the le question of languages which is decisive here. The decisive point is whether or not I can provide legal security to someone who wants to register a patent. Can I offer enforcement which is at the level of what we intended, or can the Council do something different? And I want to ask those responsible for this decision about that. Or can I simply say that uh, there will be some kind of a legal procedure, but we don't know which one? I mean, that's just not possible. This is uh, self-evident. <clears throat> if we can't reach an agreement, then there will have to be a restart, as uh, Mr. Rapkai has said. We're going to have to think again about uh, what are these pillars of this proposal, what can we agree upon, and we would have to head towards a confrontation which would make it very clear who is interested in what issues and who is blocking the situation. I am not willing to be uh, used as the village idiot. and uh, for, to be involved in something which is totally counterproductive for anyone who wants to request a patent. I think we have to raise the issue quite clearly of the Court of Justice, because this content... Well, there is the question of the three seats. The argument at first was we have to cut back, we have to simplify, and all those arguments. And then they come up with three. I saw the same thing. And then another country says, well, I need a seat too, and I absolutely need it. Well, then we can have 27 at the end of the day. <clears throat> and that would be ridiculous. And there's a political danger. <clears throat> This is an emptying of the European Patent Convention. Everybody has a, a seat which is spe specialized. And this is going to be contradictory to our goals. I mean, it's all right, well and good to say <clears throat> that you can publish patents on new areas. But to do that at the cost of the o overall economy, I think is irresponsible. <clears throat> the, I think that the Council has just acted irresponsibly in this area. Mrs. Taylor. 
I would just um, sorry, echo what my colleague, Mrs. Wickstrom, has said, um, supporting the ALDI view. It is essential that we agree on a use unitary patent as soon as possible because it's of great benefit to businesses large and small um, and it's also very important for European competitiveness particularly vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Asia. I hope very much that we can move forward over the summer with the help of legal experts in this field so we can make sure that the patent will be legally sound. Thank you. Herr Kollege. Thank you. Mr. Karim. Chairman, just uh, very quickly to put across uh, our position. Um, firstly, in relation to uh, the Articles 6 through to 8, I personally actually have no difficulty with uh, them being excluded from uh, the provisions. Uh, I certainly don't regard um, a situation of referrals to the European Court of Justice uh, as being um, based upon precedence of many of the uh, sorts of findings we've had come out, based upon the sort of uh, delays we have in them dealing with their, their current workload as being an appropriate way forward in any event, particularly when we are trying to design a specialised system whereby we deal with issues in very specific ways. Uh, turning on to some of the broader points, I share the frustrations of colleagues that have been expressed in relation to um, the uh, numbers of seats that are potentially available, the whole of uh, the languages issue. Um, and ultimately, Chairman, this is Europe, and we're doing what we have always done. We've taken something incredibly sensible, uh, and we've managed to undo it through one means or another to come up with a system which our citizens are going to look at and look at us and say, what on earth have you done? I think we may as well have come forward and said we will have one seat in Frankfurt where they will speak English, we will have one in Paris where they will speak uh, German, and we will have one in London where they will speak in French, and there will be an underlying language where anybody, wherever they like, can come forward and speak in Spanish. Thank you. I think most of the decisions will be taken locally and not in the central court, so I don't really care where the central court uh, is located. But anyway, the local chambers are the ones which will decide uh, most cases. Most patent litigation lawyers will be there. They don't want to uh, travel to Paris or Munich. They won't do that. They will want to stay local. Mr. Panera, I did speak with British experts yesterday, and I was told that Article 3 was enough to uh, live up to Article 118. Perhaps you could comment on that. Mr. Panera, please, you have the floor. Oui, merci, Monsieur Président. Je... Thank you, Chairman. Well, I won't uh, go back over the content of the opinion. I think you have received it. It's uh, fairly straightforward. We think that deleting Article 6 to 8 uh, affect essential uh, parts of the proposal. The Court of Justice asks that uh, a legal basis has to have a purpose and, and content. Well, this still has a content, but it doesn't really have any purpose anymore. So this is an act without an, an objective. There's no more object to this. It's been withdrawn. The goal is Article 3 sufficient. Well, we can always be more and more minimalist. Uh, of course, uh, the absolute minimum is to say nothing at all. This is a 25, 26-page act. Stop at three? Well, I don't think that's uh, really the point. Maybe somebody else will say, well, we could stop at four, or we could stop at nine, or stop at ten. If you withdraw six to eight, that I can say to you, and then you withdraw all the legal control of this issue, and you take away the unitary value of the patent. As to the how this was done, and to point nine of our opinion, 
the preparatory phases, the trilogues, the methods which exist now between council and parliament to ha achieve decisions in first readings, cannot uh, go beyond the treaty. The implicit or even explicit agreement by the council which led the Legal Affairs Committee to adopt its opinion in good faith, uh, assuming that this really was the will of the Council. Well, what are you going to do with your report? That's the question that arises now. I mean, technically speaking, it exists. You'd have to find a regulation, a article of the regulation, which allow you to withdraw it without uh, presenting it to the plenary. So... All right. Does the council have the right of initiative? Does it, it can suggest, but it can't interfere? I don't think there's a problem of procedure there. That doesn't mean that the procedure which has existed for years, uh, first uh, reading and the agreements between council and parliament, uh, should continue. I think the the Parliament has every interest in maintaining these uh, procedures, but this has been short-circuited. The text has been short-circuited, the procedures have been short-circuited, but w you can't say that there is there's anything binding here. There's, it's binding as part of a preparatory procedure, and according to an old ruling of the Court of uh, Justice, this uh, doesn't uh, challenge your decision. In any event, the council does have to have a first reading. That's implicit. Even if you've given your position, it can make changes. It's also clear that the commission can withdraw its text at any time if it feels that it has been sufficiently denatured or too denatured. It can simply withdraw its text. Uh, in the first reading by a council. Well, I won't uh, continue unless you ask me some uh, questions, but we have written four or five pages. That's what we think, and we continue to think about this uh, with our colleagues from the legal service of the in the Commission and Council to try to find, if possible, a way out of this unfortunate situation. Thank you. Thank you. The Commission, please. Director General. Thank you, Chair. Um, I can be rather brief following the discussion uh, that uh, you have just had. There are several features of this file over the years which have been a matter for regret, uh, and uh, perhaps the most important uh, uh, of them is the delay uh, in reaching final agreement. I don't think it's necessary uh, to recall uh, the uh, considerable importance of uh, reaching a final agreement for, for the single market, for uh, businesses, for investors, and for uh, citizens in the Union. Uh, we will need, we have needed all along, the full cooperation of all institutions in meeting uh, the target of having the first unitary patent granted in April 2014. Uh, we take note, of course, of uh, what uh, happened in the European Council uh, the other night or early morning, uh, and we take note of the uh, uh, document from uh, the Parliament's legal service that we have just received, uh, which uh, says that uh, the deletion of Article 628 would jeopardize uh, the choice of Article 118 uh, as the legal basis for the regulation. Uh, we uh, are ready to assist uh, the Council and the Parliament uh, in dealing with all outstanding legal issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now the Council Presidency. I don't know who's going to speak there. Peter Botschafter. Ambassador, go ahead. Let me start by uh, saying that I have followed the discussion carefully, the points expressed uh, are taken, and we faithfully uh, convey them to the Council. 
I would also like to state that as a presidency, we are fully aware of the importance of the unilateral patent, an issue that has been discussed for many years. We uh, remain committed to achieving an agreement as soon as possible, uh, committed to achieving a first reading agreement. We, uh, work has been done for many years on this issue that simply we cannot lose this opportunity. We are afraid that if this is not the case and if the opportunity is lost, we might need another many years before we uh, conclude this file as, as well. The reality, the reality for the Council at least was that we needed a compromise on the issue of the seat. And the compromise was reached at the last uh, European Council together with a suggestion to delete Article 6 to 8 from the regulation. We understand the irritation or the uneasiness that this uh, decision has created. It was uh, thought, we considered that it was important to give time to all of us, the European Parliament and to the Council, to think the whole issue again and discuss it uh, after the summer. In the meantime, I understand that you're going to uh, have another legal uh, opinion on the table to discuss in September. The Council is also working on this uh, line. Uh, the Commission is doing the same. I hope that uh, in early September we will be able to sit around the table having the, uh, the legal opinions in front of us and on the basis of those opinions we might be able to take the necessary uh, political decisions that will help us to move this issue forward and to a successful conclusion. This is all that I wanted to say for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I have two further requests for the floor. And then I'll give our colleague Mr. Rapkai to close up. Mrs. Wickstrom first. Actually, uh, I did not intend to bring up the issue of these three articles, but since everybody else is doing it, I might just as well give you my opinion on, on it once more. The problem of including them, 6, 7, and 8, into the regulation is that you then turn them into the EU law, which opens the possibility for referrals to ECJ on the interpretation of these articles. And we all know that that takes an awful lot of time, one to two years, imply huge extra costs for the parties, for SMEs, for individuals. Also, the ECJ will not be an expert court on patent law, which the new patent court will be. This is only if it boils down to the essence, whether or not we should include more substantive patent law into EU law. And let me recall, and I had hundreds of emails at that time, that all users, lawyers, business organizations, academics, lawyers, ju patent judges involved, unanimously wanted to see a deletion. They are extremely opposed to this, and this is also why I pleaded for the deletion of these three articles during trialogues, and I failed. After all, we now, when we take the time to reflect, we should consider who are we to overrule a unanimous group of patent judges, academics, and others, experts, advocating for a deletion of these three articles. We are here to represent citizens, but we are also here to listen and to learn. And maybe time will come in September again to listen, to learn, to adjust this, and move on once more. Aber die Quantität von E-Mails ist meist
Well, I don't know if the number of emails is a, a good benchmark. This is Lichtenberger. Thank you. Now, I'm a little bit confused because of the last statement, because I don't really see our role only in listening and learning, but uh, we're also involved in decision-making, and we also have to stand by our decisions and, of course, be prepared to compromise. But we have to stand by our decisions. So I have a question to the Commission. That was a very diplomatic statement. It's all well and good. But with diplomacy alone, we won't make any progress. So, my question to you. Now, if in the Council these three articles remain outside, so if we stick to what's been decided, I'd like to know whether the Commission is prepared to withdraw its proposal to come up with uh, something new, yes or no, because I don't really see how we can proceed on this basis. On the other hand, we're in a first reading. There's only two readings and then conciliation. Mr. Engström. Thank you. I just uh, want to comment on what was, uh, Mrs. Wickstrom said. I was very surprised by that. Our purpose is not to legislate in order to make patent judges and patent attorneys happy. The purpose of a patent uh, system in Europe is that it should be as good as possible for innovation. And it should we, uh, that, that's something I had hoped we all agree on. This is not for the benefit of the patent lawyers, it is for the benefit of inno, 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 innovation in Europe. We as Greens have all, all the time maintained that we should have a unitary patent that was properly integrated into to the judicial and political structures of Europe. Because we do have different opinions on, on what a perfect or what the best patent system will look like. But I think we all agree that it is a political decision. It's one of the few levers that we politicians have to, to affect innovation policy. So that, that's why our, our position all the time has been that, yes, we were, would have welcomed a unitary patent if it had been a proper unitary patent under political and judicial control. But again, getting back to the main point, the purpose of, of a patent system is to, to be designed so as to be good for innovation. The purpose is not to be good for patent lawyers. Thank you. Thank you. Frau. Thank you. Mrs. Lichtenberger had a question to the Commission, so maybe the Commission could answer that. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, I think our uh, goal uh, remains uh, to uh, help the Council and Parliament find agreement. So at the moment, uh, I certainly do not, do not want to go into hypothetical issues about uh, the status of the Commission's proposal. There's a proposal on the table. There is a legislative procedure underway. Uh, uh, and uh, we hope uh, that you and the Council uh, can still reach agreement. And as I said earlier, we will try to help you do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but that was also a diplomatic reply. Well, that was also a diplomatic reply. Mr. Rapkay. Well, I would have liked the Commission to, be a bit, to show a bit more conviction for their own proposal. We didn't see that, did we? Well, what about trying to defend your own proposal? Secondly, now that was the last word from the Director General. Now, we've been saying that we need to reach an agreement as soon as possible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we do have an agreement. It's nine months old. So anyone who's saying to us that we have to arrive in agreement as soon as possible has either simply just been asleep for the last year or they're just trying to push us into a corner. And we do have an agreement, and it's up to the Council now to come back to that agreement and uh, not uh, ignore the fact that they've actually reached an agreement with us, not in silence, but via letter. That's the point. I've explained my position, but there are a couple of points I want to make. First of all, along the lines of what I've just said, for more than 10 years now, the Council has prevented there being uh, 
European patent, and they continue to prevent this. So let's be clear, if there's no patent, it's the Council's fault. No, one's, oh, no one else's, it's not the Parliament, but it's the Council that's simply playing for time. Now, I'm just saying that to make things very clear. Now, I know people say, well, you're not making concessions, etc. That's not true. It's nothing to do with us. It's the Council who's at fault here, and we've got to make that very clear. And every position that I give now, I'm going to make it very clear that it's the Council's fault if we don't have a patent. No one else. And secondly, now I'd like to say something quite collegiate to Cecilia. And I've already said this in the debate a couple of months ago. Now, the question about who we are. We're the Parliament. We are the Parliament. We are the only ones who've been directly elected. Now, of course, there are the treaties from the Council. We are the, the legitimate lawmakers together with the Council, not patent lawyers. It's really not up to the patent lawyers to come up with the law. Yes, I have received a lot of emails as well from those who are saying they want to delete Article 6 and 8, but I've also received a lot of emails from people who are warning against doing that. They're saying that we shouldn't do that. In Article 118, it says that we have to have a unitary patent, patent with protection. But that wouldn't happen if we were to delete those articles. So we've got to look at both sides. And our task as the Parliament is to take a political decision. So I repeat, if the Council absolutely wants to delete a couple of articles, well, maybe we can find some in the regulation that aren't so important, but deleting those articles that are the most essential, well... All I can say is that the Parliament should not go along with that because it's infringing EU law. Now, if there's another institution uh, not playing the game, it's their fault. So we shouldn't be blamed at all for that. It's not our responsibility. We have to make sure that we're creating law that is compatible with EU law. I haven't heard any arguments to the contrary. So, yes, let's think about it all. But let me say that today it's not uh, the starting point for any new negotiations. Absolutely not. Up to now, what we've got on the table is what we've already negotiated. So anyone saying that we have to reach an agreement as soon as possible, I could say, yes, that's wonderful. Let's uh, delete everything. We got a result nine months ago, and I think we could stick to that. Thank you very much, the rapporteur. Thank you to everyone else as well. Chair kindly thanks the interpreters. Meeting is now adjourned. I'm sure after the summer break we'll have this put on the agenda again. And this afternoon at 3 o'clock we'll first of all have a very brief coordinators meeting. It won't be more than five minutes and then we'll continue with the in-camera me in meeting.